Fun. Um, welcome and good morning. Um, as you know, I'm Barbara Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to this year's workshop for the Kentucky Outreach and Information Network and the Kentucky Functional Needs Collaborative. Um, I am a public information officer here at the Cabinet for Health and Family Services, and I've also been managing of the COIN Network for many years now, since it was actually established back in 2005. Um, we've been really happy with the success that the network has had so far for reaching our functional and access needs populations during public health emergencies and natural disasters. This is the 11th year that we've been hosting this workshop, and we'd like to uh, extend a, a great thank you to all the health departments for opening up your ITD sites, to uh, the participants that may be coming, and just for helping us support this great measure. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the, the COIN network, uh, very basically, um, can you guys make sure that your mics are muted, please? Thank you. Um, it's a grassroots emergency communication network that we established to ensure um, that our vulnerable populations were receiving messages during public emergencies and natural disasters. And it's successful because it uses a trusted member that's either within one of these population groups or that's a member of one of these certain population groups because um, members of these populations tend not to trust receiving information from government sources. So by having these trusted individuals in place, it really has been assisting us with getting our message to the places that it really needs to go. Um, the functional access needs populations that are in the COIN right now include the blind and visually impaired, the deaf and hard of hearing, our remote rural populations here in the state, our non-English proficiency speakers, limited English proficiency speakers, and the illiterate. We have um, older persons, young children that we can reach, and individuals with disabilities. And there's more of these groups being identified all the time. So we try and be all inclusive in our network. We have about 450 members right now. And we offer free preparedness materials from brochures to coloring books for kids for emergency preparedness, refrigerator magnets that have important emergency contact information. We have the magnet available in English, Spanish, and we also have a Braille version. So please, if you're interested in anything, please contact me. And how the network works is the message is sent out to our COIN members, and they in turn take the message and they adapt it to reach the certain population groups. For example, they may translate it into a certain language that members of their population speak, or they may scale it down and make it easily um, textable, perhaps to the deaf population. So once that message is passed, those people take the message and pass it on to other members. So it kind of looks like a spider web effect with a coin, a spider web effect with a coin message in the middle and the branches out to the side are how the message is, is being passed. It can be passed um, via a telephone tree, a distribution list with an email. If the power is out, it could be passed face-to-face uh, -face any way that any way that you can assist us with passing on our emergency messaging, it's, it's a very great thing. A, a very brief overview of our informative workshop today. Um, we are going to switch this up. We are going to have the active aggressor and active shooter presentation first, followed by an update from the Kentucky Functional Needs Collaborative. Then we'll have a presentation on pet and animal emergency planning vulnerable populations and climate-related health impacts. We'll have an update on the Zika virus. And if you have any questions and answers, if you have any questions and answers, uh, please make sure that you ask them after each presentation. And um, just as Joe Allen said, uh, someone right now doesn't have their mic muted. So uh, please make sure after you ask your question that you um, re-mute your mic. And um, technical and equipment issues, once again, um, contact your local IT person. Or if you can't get it resolved, the Commonwealth Office of Technology Bridge is 502-564-9411.
All of our presentations have been posted on the COIN website. If you'd like to go on there and run off copies, I apologize. I just received some presentations as of yesterday, so I couldn't mail them ahead of time. So if you go on the COIN website, click on the workshop tab on the far left side. In 2016, I have all of the materials for this year's workshop there. This is also being videotaped. The YouTube video should be available sometime next week if you had anyone who missed the presentation. And if you could please fill out your sign-in sheets and send them back to me, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, once again, I mailed this packet out two weeks ago to everybody that I had a contact um, address for for the workshop. I mailed out some sign-in sheets, so if you did not receive those, I also posted the sign-in sheet on the workshop page also. Um, if you could please mail them back to me, or you could email me and attach them, or you could even fax them to me. Um, this is my contact information. I'm at the uh, Cabinet for Health and Family Services Communications Office, 275 East Main Street, 5C-A. Frankfurt 40621. Um, once again, uh, the healthalerts.ky.gov slash coin is the webpage, and I would greatly appreciate it. And now I would like to welcome Franklin County Sheriff Pat Melton and Deputy Sheriff Monty Chapel, who will give a presentation on the active shooter and active planning and awareness. And I just wanted to extend a, a super thank you to both of them for helping our safety team here at the CHR complex plan for this type of scenario. Hopefully it will never happen, but we really appreciate the time that they've given us in planning for this measure. Thank you. Okay, time now. Do I need a back in? Good morning. Thank you for having us, and thanks for, for joining us this morning. Uh, we're going we're gonna to give you some things to think about today. Um, and probably a couple of the biggest thing is, is that you'll be able to identify, alert, and survive an active shooter or active aggressor within your facility and give you some things to think about as far as, as what you're going to do and, and how you're going to react and, and what you can do to help protect your staff, your team, and, and lives there at your facility. Um, with me is Deputy Chapel. Uh, he's developed an active shooter program here in Franklin County for our schools. Uh, also, we are working with CHFS uh, on their active shooter program here. Um, Deputy Chapel is probably in his systems in probably 16 or 20 counties right now across our Commonwealth to help protect our kids, especially in the school systems and universities across our Commonwealth. So um, I'm going to let him start off with the overview, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we're going to kind of tag team it as we go. You guys have to bear with us here a little bit as far as patient or not, uh, IT techs. Um, we're going to talk about active shooter, what active shooter is today. Uh, active shooter is also the translation. Active shooter is a progressive, uh, it's, it's progressive. It's now become active shooter, active aggressor. So it's not, not everything is always uh, somebody bringing a gun into the building. It can uh, be somebody starts off. It'd be a knife, but starts off with um, workplace violence. Um, so I'll define today: so active shooter is an individual or multiple individuals actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a confined and populated area, typically through the use of firearms. So typically associated with schools, the threat of an active shooter exists anywhere people gather, such as college camp camp campuses, movie theaters, churches, office buildings, and restaurants. Have all been targeted by active shooters. Although many perpetrators have a history of negative, sometimes violent behavior, there are still no single accurate one size fits all profile of an active shooter. So, 
Compact the shooter, identify alert, and survive. Workplace, workplace, workplace violence stats. Uh, from 2006 to 2010, an average of 561 workers per year have been killed as a result of work-related homicides. Obviously, on today's media and social media, those are all sensationalized uh, quite a bit as well, but any loss of life in the workplace is one too many. About four out of five uh, homicides uh, victims were male. Uh, robbers and other assailants accounted for 72% of the homicides to men, for example, and 37% of the homicides to women. So big disparity there. Uh, relatives and other personnel, personal acquaintances accounted for only 3% of assailants of homicides for men, but 39% for women. So you see that jump back up. Um, relatives, um, shootings accounted for 80% of all the workplace homicides in 2010. So, you know, 80% of those are violent deaths. Coworkers and former coworkers were the assailants in 12% of all shootings. Somebody got mad, come back, and, and took care of it, um, took care of business uh, in their mind. Robbers were, were the assailants in another 40% of those, and then nearly half of these shootings, 48% occurred in public buildings. So that's something that's important for you to think about and have a plan for your facility uh, wherever you're located across the Commonwealth. And with uh, that one stat that we looked at with that with the women at 39 uh, percent, that should go that should show you that there's a, a definite relationship between EPOs and DBOs, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, so that's what we want to see. Do you see that jump up there at Bosque is the women in that? So that's something that we need to be aware of. And like I said, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, for the workplace homicides, there's 405, I believe, in 2014. It was uh, the biggest jump that we the biggest area is the retail trade. And government is the second biggest, it's 17%. So if you're one of those two, you have the majority of the uh, likelihood of being in the place that an active shooter or active aggressor takes place. Um, so that's where we uh, gather some of, some of the lowest is 3% um, is in manufacturing. So it's not necessarily the manufacturers that do that. It's government buildings. Again, we want to talk about EPOs and DBOs and how that's going to affect, how can affect those numbers. Awareness of actions of coworkers, and this is something you really need to pay attention to. You know, everybody has a bad day uh, from day to day occasionally, but noticeably angry, irritable, threatening, uh, escalation from verbal to physical. You know, if you're working with a coworker that's like that, pay a little more attention, make sure your supervisor is aware of that. Uh, also, knowledge of any prior violence issues. Um, hopefully, if you all are a team and a family like we are at the Sheriff's Office, you know the background, you know who you're working with, you know how they are. And you know if they're having a bad day or something's really, really not right. Um, EPOs, DBOs, or, or IPOs, um, and make sure that supervisors are aware of those. If uh, Peggy or, or Steve have an issue and you know that, make sure your supervisor's aware because you never know how that's going to escalate and people react differently to uh, stress like that, uh, jealousies, and everything else. So make sure you're aware of that uh, as you report that to your supervisor, and you're not ratting on anybody, you're just making them aware, hey, there's a problem here. If we see him coming in here, there may be a problem, or if we see her coming in here, it may be a problem as an aggressor. Once it goes from the uh, workplace to an active shooter situation, it goes from workplace violence to somebody having a bad day. A lot of times there's a prior video that we sometimes show that these people start to have a bad day, and it and it progresses in. And you see the other coworkers just standing around. They're doing they're doing nothing. Nobody's calling 911. Nobody's trying to interfere. They're just watching. Um, so I think uh, it was uh, the Virginia Tech shootings. As uh, the shooter went through the building, the uh, professor was wrestling with the shooter, and everybody was still sitting in their seats. Nobody got up. Nobody ran. Nobody called. I. I guess a lot of times it is just kind of overwhelming that, hey, this reality. So um, uh, those are things you have to really be watching for is, to, you know, to you see something going on, you need to start taking some type of action. Uh, don't be scared not to take any kind of action. Um, we had a, uh, and again, it's not active shooter as much as active aggressor. Um, we got a video here that I want to show you just real quick. Listen to it. 
Alfred Nolan was shot multiple times by an off-duty deputy who was working security at Vaughn Foods in Moore. The officer shot at Nolan yesterday after the suspect allegedly stabbed a woman to death and beheaded her, as well as injured another one. Nolan is in the hospital being treated for multiple gunshot wounds, and we were told he was on an angry rampage and stabbed the first two people he saw. The victims did not know the suspects. They were just in his way. Another part of the business, for whatever reason, uh, became upset, came back, and doesn't really have any uh, relation to either victim. They just happened to be uh, in his way as he came in upset. Now, with that video, that just goes to show you can have just a regular work day, nothing going on. This was um, just a, a food manufacturing plant. This happened that. And like, like you said, he had no relation to the victims or anything else. I think a lot of times we miss a lot of the, the um, telltale signs that's coming on. Nobody, somebody's scared to say something, somebody's scared to challenge them. It's okay. These days and times, it's okay to challenge somebody. Hey, what are you doing here or whatever? Hey, somebody call 911. Let's get, uh, let's get the police head this, this way. If it turns out to be nothing, us as law enforcement officers will we'll be glad to come 100 times over nothing than we would one time where somebody failed not to say something to, to somebody and start the alert. Because the alert has to start from the very first survivor, not the uh, not the last survivor, but from the first one. They see something, and then they call. Um, what did you, and you think as you're sitting there? What does an active shooter look like? And as you can tell, I mean, it, it can be anybody. It can be anybody at any time. Um, there's no profile on what an active shooter looks like, but there are a lot of behavioral indicators. So, is the person next to you have the capability of being an active shooter? Is, is the man or woman walking in your office right now? Is something so bad wrong uh, that, that they're gonna, their intent is to hurt or kill or maim? So there's not a, any generic personal appearance that, that you can tell, but here are some good indicators to show you what, uh, what someone may do and things to give you tips to, to react to. That, um prior image of that fellow, he was an accountant, um, blonde hair, blue eye guy in Norway, and uh, he was responsible for the carnage they had, they had for over 80 people that was killed. If somebody called from the first survivor or the first person that saw something, maybe that number wouldn't have been as high. And that's what we want people to start uh, to realize that, you know, if you're going to have, you might have some, um, you might have some people hurt, but you're not going to have as many people hurt if somebody starts taking that action and starts moving that. And there's ways that we can do that now that I think we're trying to progress to. There's a difference between schools and workplaces. Um, and we're talking about the workplace here. You can see something ahead of time. Um, just start that call. And also you can form these different individual teams. Okay, some of the things in here are in place to alert in case of an active shooter. Number of support pillars on each floor or a number of areas to assist us. You know, the biggest problem we have uh, going to schools or into especially large buildings like CHFS or even the Annex uh, when we had the threat here uh, earlier this year was where's room 354? Obviously we, we think it's on the third floor but where's it at? It's a, it's a big building and a big place so having a numbering system and a lettering system to help us identify uh, where we're going there and where that shooter may or may not be is, is a huge help to do it also, are there any paint buttons in your office? Uh, if you all deal with a lot of public and a lot of public service, um, a panic switch might be something that you want to push to notify uh, your local 911 dispatch that you do have an emergency and, and get the cavalry on the way. Uh, that time saves lives. So the quicker you react or the quicker you're able to identify that, hey, there's a problem, get, get the cavalry on the way to, to help. Uh, knowledge of the nearest exit and other routes of the exit, uh, you know, if right where we are in this room right now, if something would happen, we could always bust a window out to get out of here. Uh, don't you got to think out of the box? Don't think, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm destroying public property. It's your life. Bust a window out, whatever you need to do to get out of the way uh, to get out. Um, also, people, people, some people carry personal defense items, pepper spray. Uh, are you carrying a concealed deadly weapon? Uh, if so, uh, who are those people that, that carry a weapon or have a weapon on them? Uh, and also, you need to make sure that that, uh, that you comply with your cabinet policy and state government policy on uh, CCDWs in the workplace. But all those are tools and resources to help prevent you from being a victim. 
Uh, you can also always barricade a door, uh, turn off the lights, cover a window. Um, a lot of different things that you can do to help prevent yourself and, and your team from being a victim. And that's one thing that the sheriff and I discovered when we had this round, tab, uh, round table meeting, um, when we had that incident here, that the policies and the procedures of carrying a concealed deadly weapon was uh, even amongst the upper echelon that uh, there was some misconception. They really didn't know there wasn't any positive procedure. And also, if you are carrying a carry concealed weapon and you do engage, remember when the police are coming, they're looking for a shooter. So you're going to have to, uh, those are some of the things that you're going to have to, to think about. Because I know I was the first one in the building that day, and that's the first thing I'm looking for, somebody with a gun. And that's the only thing that the police are looking for, somebody with a gun. So if you do carry concealed, you need to start thinking a little bit uh, ahead of time. You know, when the police do start to show up, you know, are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? So and one thing we talked about was, or we have been talking about as active shooter, um, is the individual security teams. Now, we use a lot of times as police officers is what we call contact and cover, okay? Everybody should have a role in this. If you're the receptionist, this is your job to make sure that you start to identify, you see something out there coming out the parking lot, that you let somebody else know, be it an alarm, be it a button, be it a call. You have somebody else respond. So there's two or three other people up front. If you start to have an incident where you can maybe de-escalate instead of having a gentleman come in or a, a, an employee coming in and letting it, let it escalate, it's a little bit just of being one-on-one. -on -one. Um, somebody's got to be in charge of sound alarm. Somebody has to be in charge of that. Um, like we said, preferably the first person to contact so we don't have the incident we had at, in Norway. So um, the clock starts for law enforcement when the survivor notifies the authorities. And that's usually about a six minute window. It might be more if you're in a more rural area like Eastern Kentucky. Um, here it's probably a little, in Frankfurt, it's probably a little bit less than six minutes. It's probably right around three minutes. And we've really made some steps up in our school with our active shooter buttons that we can actually even send our cameras from the school if you push our panic button the one we have designated just for active shooter, it will send all the cameras from inside the school to police dispatch. So dispatch is actually looking live time what's going on. So if they can tell where threat is, they can see where it's at, they, they can identify it because it's just going to be chaos around everybody else. So one of the, the key there is when the clock starts is when we're notified to get there to help and, and to help you mitigate. Um, run, hide, or fight. Those are the three things that, that are human nature that we do. Um, you know, if you're going to run, you got to know where your exits are. If it's a normal exit, is it blocked? Then how else you, where else are you going to go? Are you going to bust a window to jump out? Um, are you going to shelter in place? Are, you know, are you going to hide? What provisions are currently in place for taking shelter? Um, you know, you have a reinforced desk. Do you have any, any old bulletproof vest from somebody behind your desk? Uh, are doors with locks? Get something between yourself and the shooter. Uh, cover versus concealment. Cover is some place that you can go. And, and, and you're not going to get shot. It's, it's going to be something that, that a bullet won't penetrate. Uh, concealment is a place you're hiding that a bullet could come through um, and, and, and possibly strike you, or if they shoot through a door or something else that the shooter would do that, then you're going to get shot. So you need to think about cover versus concealment, and then also fight. What means are you going to do to survive? And, and I think as a nation and as, as uh, I think we have the inhib inhibit, and us, most of us will fight, a lot of us will run or hide, but I think you got to fight. If, if you know what's going to be between you and somebody else or your over, overwhelming numbers, if that's your last resort, you got to fight to defend yourself and defend your family and your team and your office. Uh, if that means throwing a chair, if that means whatever, but you got to be in it to win it and uh, make sure that you, you fight uh, if that's the last resort. And that's, that's a tactical pressure. Um, you know, by shortening their time and increases your time, the more time that you have, the longer you're going to survive. Um, on your evacuation, we just want you to be aware of your environment. And a lot of people, they don't even practice it. They just assume, you know, hey, can you break that window? Hey, am I on the second floor? What am I going to do if I am on the second floor? You know, try to find at least two exits this, this nearest to you. Have an escape plan in mind. Just every once in a while, just kind of take it. You know, if you hear something, hey, guess what? If you hear something sound like firecrackers, Go ahead and leave the building. You know, I told my son in school, I said, son, have you ever hear firecrackers in school? I said, go ahead, shut the door and break the window out. I said, dad won't mind replacing the window. You know, windows is easy to place. So if you hear something, you really need to find an escape route to get out. So 
Um, also, do not try to remove any of these wounded people. Um, you know, when we come in, we're going to be stepping over a lot of wounded people because we're going to try to get to the shooter. Then we'll come back. You know, we have to make it safe for the uh, firefighters and the EMS to be able to get in there. So uh, we just want everybody out. We want to see their hands. And we have some uh, um, some more tips about that. Um, when you come out of the building, we don't know who the bad guy is. Uh, chances are we don't know who you are. So as we respond and you come out, we're going to ask you to keep your hands in plain sight uh, where we can see them because we don't know if you're the bad guy trying to fit in with the rest of the employees trying to escape. So uh, there, there's ways that we're going to do that, and we're going to be very verbally strong with you telling you what to do and how to do it um, in, in a very proficient manner to so get you out as quickly as we can so we can interact with the, uh, with the bad guy and hopefully find him and contain him. Uh, the quicker we contain the bad guy, uh, the quicker everybody else can get out and get to a safe place and less, than, more, less likely more people uh, will survive, or more likely the more people will survive than less. Um, your hiding place shouldn't trap or restrict your movement. Uh, example, if you go in a closet, you're pretty much stuck. Now, if it's a closet that, with, a, with a heavy door and it's got room that you can get away from that doorway and hide and you can lock it or restrict access to it, then obviously that may be a good option for you. Um, barricade yourself. You know, in this room right here, you've got all these tables in here. In the rooms I'm looking at on TV here, you all got a bunch of tables. You know, you can always put those up, lock the door, cover the window, put as much stuff up against it, make it as hard for that individual to get to you or to be able to shoot through something to get to you uh, in order to hurt you. Also, remain in hiding until, until law enforcement gives you an all clear. When that happens, when law enforcement comes into the building, we had several people here pop up behind a cubicle or pop out of a door, uh, you know, make sure when, when law enforcement announces and you've got to verify, you know, verify that that's the police uh, when they come in or sheriff, make sure you verify who they are. And, and then when you come up, make sure you come up slowly with your hands so we can see that. Uh, again, we don't know who you are and if you're a bad guy or a good guy, and we don't want anything to happen to you while that happens um, as we clear the building and it takes time to clear a large facility. It takes time for us to work through and to get floor by floor to clear every place. Engage an attacker, we always say engage attackers as a last resort. But, you know, here's the thing. If you're there with them and we've seen video proof of people that uh, one fellow uh, attacked a guy with a gun with a can of uh, pepper spray. And then he just held him and bear, bear hugged him. Uh, again, that's tactful pressure. So um, if you have to, do it as a last resort. Um, use whatever you have for your weapons. You know, if, if you play softball and you happen to bring your softball bag with you to work, you know, there's your bat in there. Well, hey, there's your bat. Um, uh, you know, don't hesitate to do what you have to do. Once you do it, you need to bring it on, and you have, we'll worry about everything else later, okay? Proper interaction with law enforcement. Uh, keep your hands where they can be seen at all times. Come out, come up. That way we're, we know you're not a threat. Uh, that way as we're scanning and we see you come up, you're not a threat and you won't get hurt. Do not touch, hug, or make a quick movement towards any law enforcement when they're coming in. Uh, some victims are traumatized and they want to come and, and hug you or grab onto you. Um, again, we don't know who you are. We're looking for a threat. And, and that could be considered as such. So make sure, again, keep your hands up, come out. Um, we will pass over bodies when we come in to clear a place. Uh, we're not there for that. We're there to get this, the active shooter until that threat's done. Once we secure an area, we've got EMS on standby to come in and help uh, clear that area and triage the victims. Um, only communicate what's vital to the, to the first responders, to law enforcement when they come in your, when, in your facility if you would encounter one. Uh, make sure it's vital information. It's something that we need to know. If we don't need to know it, just keep your hands up and keep moving and follow the instructions that we're talking to you and telling you what to do to help get you out of there and save your life. Also, then, then the final piece of this puzzle is, uh, is accountability. Um, if you're a manager, you make sure that you got your people accounted for because somebody's going to be calling, well, hey, where's so-and-so at? You know, we're going to have all kinds of chaos of people going to the hospital, trying to find out where they were. They might have just left for lunch during this, and they've gone to the uh, grocery store or something for a minute to run an errand. So make sure you know where your people are and how you can keep up with them. 
So even if it means a roster or whatever, if it's larger, we have 40, there's 4,500 employees in this building that we had to try to find some kind of accountability for. So, and, you know, when you leave this meeting, you know, think what your plans are going to be. Think we're Always have a plan, think ahead, uh, and hopefully this, this dialogue has opened up a place for you to think about uh, for your facility, for your teammates, uh, for what, where you're going to go and what's going to happen uh, when you do that. Um, also, have a rally point. Make sure you have a rally point somewhere uh, far enough away where you can get your staff so you know who's there, who's not there. Is there a PA system in your building? Is that something you can announce? We've got an active aggressor, an active shooter within your facility. So those are some things to think about. Um, we're going to open it up to uh, questions now. If you have any questions, uh, we'll take those. Must have done a really good job, man. Wow. Very good. Guys, thanks for your time. Thanks for having us. Uh, if we can help you in any way, our email and our phone number's there. And uh, please contact us or your local sheriff's office or police department for uh, guidance and help. Thank you for having us. one side out there that's got their mic open. Um, next we have Betty Shields. Um, she will give an update on the Kentucky Functional Meats Collaborative. Um, Betty's a longtime COIN member and she's also the current chair of, of the Collaborative and director of the Kentucky Emergency Preparedness for Aging and Long-Term Care Program at the University of Louisville. Thank you, Barbara. It's a pleasure to be here t today for our annual visit um, with you all. And it's been a very busy year in 2016 with the collaborative. Um, <clears throat> we're going through some changes, as always happens, and I think they're exciting changes and improvements. Um, <clears throat> one of our primary efforts this past year was to identify vulnerable populations, um, the scope of those populations in terms of the uh, prevalence of con conditions and the percentage of the general Kentucky po population as a whole. So you see in front of you a table that lists the data that actually is available if you have access to WebEOC, Kentucky WebEOC, that's W-E-B-E-O-C, uh, through the cabinet. Uh, you also will get the individual county detail behind this information and can be helpful for your um, local and district health departments. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we find with this data, however, is that um, it comes from many different sources. It's drawn from many sources, and quite a bit of this data is 8 to 10 years old. So a major emphasis over the next 12 months is going to be uh, to partner with some state and um, regional organizations that have access to the most current data and be able to update this so that everybody across the state as well as at your local and, and a district level have a much better handle on um, the prevalence of um, vulnerability and population. Just from this slide, you see that our largest vulnerability is children, and that's going to be true across the country. Uh, and that's ch children under 18, anybody under 18. Um, I've collapsed data on this slide so that uh, we don't have it broken down by range of ages within the under 18 group. Nevertheless, um, it's almost a quarter of our population and therefore a vulnerable 
population and number two would be those sixty five and older and as you know that population is growing and will can continue to grow for probably the next twenty years it's the fastest growing population and among sixty five and older over eighty eighty five is an even faster growing population we look at persons with um, mobility issues, whether it's wheelchair, cane, or ambulatory difficulty, and that's a, a group that's a flag for us. Many of those per persons um, live in residential settings, whether it's in long-term care or hospital settings, as well as live in the com community. Another significant population are those living in poverty. And persons living in poverty have issues with limitations in access to services, uh, limitations in education, possibly, and therefore limitations in um, mechanisms to create effective preparedness plans. And without plans, we are at the disasters um, that can call. We are vulnerable to a disaster. Um, the greater the impairment to um, education, cognition, even uh, literacy, if uh, you think about that. In the past year, you've heard me talk about uh, the needs assessment that we did on behalf of the collaborative related to the elder and, and disabled population over 65 living in subsidized housing across the Commonwealth. And I, I presented this slide last year with the percentages of those living with different types of disabilities. And that ranking for K Kentucky in those categories relative to the United States as a whole, and what we saw and what we continue to, to see is unfortunately Kentucky ranks among the top four states in the, the country with persons with significant di disability over 65. The reason I included this slide is that once we have better data on other vulnerable categories, I hope to be able to have similar data to break it down. The goals for the collaborative this year include completing a resource booklet that we've been working on for quite some time for independent shelter operators relative to health con conditions, uh, listed by health con condition, identifying some common symptomology, and then incorporating um, access and links to resources, local as well as state resources, and other stakeholders who could assist in a community shelter should any of these vulnerable po populations or those with the health con conditions um, need assistance. That's in addition to the work of the functional and access teams, the FAST teams. Another goal for the year is the dissemination of a medical needs shelter plan that was de developed last year and conducting training and awareness on that medical needs shelter plan. Um, <clears throat> there is a fine line between when someone is eligible to um, stay in a community-based shelter for the general population versus requiring special medical needs and having an adjacent medical needs shelter established. We also will conduct training and awareness on the independent shelter operators booklet, the efforts of our FAST team and pro providing additional training for that, and working with your local and, and district health de departments, directors, staff, and then with the healthcare coalitions in each of your regions. And finally, the development of an emergency preparedness manual for those living in high, high <coughs> mostly high-rise um, HUD-funded pr properties, although it can also be low-rise. Um, but we have numerous buildings that are well over five stories um, that house these populations. And if you think about the, um, mo the risk due to mobility constraints, 
um, this is a major con concern for us. And these folks are tenants of HUD-funded buildings. They are not clients. There aren't programs provided within these buildings. And so HUD requirements relate to the safety of the building itself, not to the people in the building. So the development of our emergency preparedness manual will relate to uh, staff planning as well as tenant planning for individual emergency preparedness and uh, as a group, those living in the buildings themselves. So this would be an incredible enhancement. And frankly, I don't know of where else it's being done in the United States. Activities of the a collaborative th this year, aside from our, our quarterly meetings, um, included pr providing a training to uh, the Kentucky Crisis and Response Board annual conference about seniors and persons with disability and emergency preparedness training and planning. Um, <clears throat> was interesting, the audience at that conference included community mental health center workers, pro professionals, as well as community stakeholders. And um, a sheriff from one of our rural counties came up to me after the presentation and thanked me for talking about um, what <clears throat> vulnerable populations likely pre present both to an emergency shelter as well as to first responders and some effective tools in ways to engage them and to respond. Um, I also was asked to give a webinar to the Department for Homeland Security Geriatric and Elder D Disaster Resilience Group. Uh, this is a national work group for uh, geriatric emergency preparedness, if you will. And the topic of the webinar was Alzheimer's d disease and emergency planning challenges. What's interesting with this webinar is many of, um, especially the, the developmentally and intellectually impaired uh, persons with disabilities have many of the same pre presenting issues. They live with chronic illness. They may have cognitive impairment. They are at high risk for falls. So in terms of local health department planning within com community shelters, um, as you prepare for responding or sheltering older per persons, um, it's the very same actions, the very same planning for persons with de developmentally and intellectually dis dis intellectual d disabilities. Uh, at the request of Department for Homeland Security, we also filmed the content of that webinar as a YouTube video and we'll soon post it to our K Kentucky Emergency Preparedness for Aging and Long-Term Care P Program website. And if you haven't gone to, to our website, uh, it's worth a look for lots of different reasons. Um, that website address is KYEP for Emergency Preparedness, LTC for Long-Term Care .com. We also, in the development of the Emergency Preparedness Manual for HUD-funded properties um, have established a work group of experts, sub subject matter experts, related to elders living in HUD-funded pro properties as well as those with uh, behavioral health and de developmental and intellectual disabilities. So we are expanding our partnerships within the collaborative expanding our target populations in terms of needs assessments and, and identifying gaps and um, targeting the development of additional resources and tools. And then we recently, Be Becky Gillis, the head of the preparedness branch, and I pre presented um, <clears throat> the work of this co collaborative to the Kentucky Behavioral Health and Developmental and Intellectual Dis Disability Department and their leadership. Um, it has been a major focus of the collaborative or a, a major request by the members of the collaborative to collect better data 
on these populations and also to have a more can concerted preparedness effort with them whether it's training engagement in the collaborative as well as planning so we have undertaken that they've been very excited and re receptive we're already working together on some training and planning efforts over the next year with them and really look for that effort to build tremendous excitement and a whole new range of partners for the collaborative additional new partners include the Kentucky Governor's Council on Alzheimer's disease and related dementias project carrot which is an a nonprofit organization in the state that works primarily in rural areas to refurbish electronic and assistive devices for persons in a disaster who may have lost theirs or had theirs broken in the disaster so if there's a need for an elect an electric wheelchair if there are needs for other types of assistive devices and electronic devices project carrot has a great mechanism of partnering and providing resources for that we have all we're also partnering partnering with leading age Kentucky which is one of the two state long-term care associations the membership of which for for leading age includes those operators of personal care homes and residential communities for persons with developmentally and intellectual impairment along those same lines Christian care communities is a new partner for the the collaborative and working with us on the work group for the development of that emergency preparedness manual for operators of assisted living and personal care as well as independent living units across the state so once we get better data especially on behavioral health and DID we plan to use the model that we developed with the HUD needs assessment last year and develop slides by region as well as ways of disseminating data by county out to your offices as well as your health care coalitions so that you get a sense of your exposure to that at those at risk populations as well as the scope of what those needs might be and definitely assist in planning for emergency sheltering and emergency response efforts on an ongoing basis we work to utilize new relationships to gain improved and current data on vulnerable populations share that data with regional coalitions and local and district health departments support regional coalitions in their functional and access needs planning and outreach so if you're a local or a district health department and you're doing vulnerable population or functional and access needs planning by all means please get involved or find out what's happening with your local health care coalition that's part of the hospital preparedness program every region across the state has one and they're very active and I work with them as well as with a collaborative and then we ongoing effort to expand representation on the collaborative itself any questions all right thank you very much and let's hope we have an event less year moving forward Hold on, folks. We're having a little bit of technical.
problems here. <laughs> oh gosh. Where'd our tech go? I don't know. <laughs> he... Yes, I, it's coming up. The arrow's coming okay. up. Mm -hmm. I, uh -huh. Refresh? No. Uh, Screen resolution? Yeah, it's screen resolution. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one of the things should say, uh, it'll say extend display. Mm -hmm. Yes. You want to click on that and change it to duplicate. Okay, I did it. And hit OK. Do I hit op apply? Looks like we have it. I think we got it. Okay. Okay. So, sorry, guys. The tech guy is not here, so we're doing our best. Um. Um, we've actually had this topic being requested for the last couple of workshops, and we're very happy to be able to present uh, pet and animal emergency planning today. We have Frank Ruggiero from the, he is the um, shelter manager at the Jessamine County Animal Care and Control, and we're very happy that he's here to give us this presentation today. 
Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Barbara. So let's talk a little bit about emergency planning for pets. We're going to uh, focus on companion animals and not so much uh, equine or livestock or exotics or anything like that. Um, plan, planning for animal evacuation, uh, if in fact you do need to evacuate, see, some of these things you, you should consider. Um, if you must leave your residence, have a plan for your family pets. Go online and locate several pet-friendly hotels in and out of your area. Identify friends or relatives outside your area where you and your pets can stay. If there is a disaster pending, evacuate early with your pets. Working animals and livestock, don't wait for the mandatory evacuation order. Animals should have some type of identification, whether it's leg bands, tattoos, microchips, or just identification tags on their collars with your information, address, and telephone number. Uh, plan for your risks. Um, there are, there are actions that should be taken before, during, and after an event that are unique to each hazard. And what I mean by hazards is each individual situation, whether it be floods, tornadoes, uh, things of that nature. Uh, identify the hazards that have happened or could happen in your area and plan for the unique actions that, uh, that will take place. Local emergency management Offices can help you identify the hazards in your area and outline the local plans and recommendations for each hazard. Uh, share the hazard specific, specific information with your family members and include pertinent materials in your family disaster plan. Tailor your, tailor your plans to your needs. As you prepare, tailor your plans and supplies to your specific daily living needs and responsibilities. Most of all, individuals have both specific personal needs as well as resources to assist others. You and your household and others should help rely on, uh, you should help or rely on for assistance, should, uh, work, you should work together. As part of tailoring your plan, consider working with others to create networks of neighbors, relatives, friends, coworkers who will assist each other in an emergency. Discuss your needs and responsibilities and how the people in the network can assist each other with communication, care for children, pets, or specific needs like the operation of durable medical equipment. Uh, create your own personal network in specific areas where you need assistance. Putting together an animal emergency kit, uh, three weeks worth of water and food stored which can, uh, with a can opener in a waterproof container. Now, I used to recommend three days worth of food, but they've changed it to three weeks because uh, you just don't, you can never predict what's going to happen and where, where these disasters can lead. So be safe and carry enough food and water for your animals. Toys, treats, and bedding because familiar items reduce the stress on animals. Medications, medical records, your veterinarian's name and telephone number. Current photos with you and your family and pets. Sturdy leashes, harnesses, or carriers to move pets safely and securely. Litter, litter boxes, newspapers, paper towels, plastic trash bags, and household chlorine bleach for sanitation. First aid supplies such as cotton bandage, rolls, tape, scissors, antibiotic ointment, flea and tick prevention, latex gloves, alcohol, saline solution, as well as pet first aid ref reference books. Uh, what's in your pet preparedness kit? Well, you should have some food, you should have a checklist, you should have some treats, you should have identification on your animals with, with your harnesses, leashes, and collars. You should carry some sanitation products and a first aid kit. And you can see at the bottom right of this slide that there is a, a kind of a makeshift checklist where you can go down the list and make sure you have everything. And your, your preparedness kit could be as simple as 
a plastic tub from Walmart, as the top right slide shows, uh, filled with certain things that you've gathered, uh, household items, or you can go out and spend a lot of money on a pre pre uh, prepared kit uh, that has the necessary things that you're going to need in it. But either or, they both work as long as you have all the items that you're going to need, uh, and that checklist will help you uh, obtain those items. Items to consider is pet food, bottled water, medications, keep your veterinary records handy, cat litter pans, manual can opener, uh, food dishes, first aid kits, and other supplies, and make sure you have a secure pet carrier. Leashes, harnesses uh, for your pets, and if he panics, he can't escape. If you evacuate your home, don't leave your pets behind. Please make a plan and include your pets in your plan. Protect your pets during disasters. Bring your pets inside immediately. Have newspapers on hand for sanitary purposes. Feed animals moist or canned food so that they will need less water to drink. Animals have the instincts Animals have instincts about severe weather changes and will often isolate themselves if they are afraid. Bring them inside early can stop them from running away. Never leave a pet outside or tied uh, up during a storm. Separate dogs and cats. Even if your dogs and cats normally get along, the, the stress and the anxiety of an emergency situation can cause your pets to act irrationally. Uh, in an emergency, you may, you may have to take your birds with you, uh, talk with your veterinarian uh, or local pet store about specific food dispensers that regulate the amount of food bird, a bird is given. If you evacuate your home, do not leave your pets behind. Pets most likely cannot survive on their own, and if by some remote chance they do, you may not be able to find them once the situation is mitigated. Uh, if you evacuate, uh, if you are going to a public shelter, it's important to understand that animals may not be allowed. Uh, plan in advance for shelter alternatives that will work for both you and your pets. Consider loved ones or friends outside your immediate area who would be willing to help. Or check with your emergency management to find out if your local shelter is a co-located shelter with, uh, that allows uh, humans in one side and pets on the other side or uh, centrally or a, a closely located shelter for animals. Make a backup emergency plan in case you can't care for your animals yourself. Develop a buddy system with your neighbors. Again, your, uh, your emergency kit for your pets could be as simple as something you threw together from uh, items purchased in Walmart or it could be one of those extensive uh, 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 packages that are put together and sold. Caring for your pets after a disaster. If you leave town after a disaster, take your pets with you. Pets are unlikely to survive on their own. In the first few days after a disaster, leash your pets when they go outside. Always maintain close contact. Familiar scents and landmarks may be altered and your pet may become confused and lost. Also, snakes and other dangerous animals may be brought into the area with, uh, with flood areas. Down power lines are also a hazard. The behavior of your pets may change after an emergency. Normally quiet and friendly pets become aggressive or defensive. Watch animals closely, leash dogs, and place them in fenced yards with access to shelter and water. Uh, there are some uh, there are some uh, campaigns that are out. Uh, at the slide on the top left is the National Animal, Animal Disaster Preparedness Day. And then the slide on the bottom is, is uh, Disaster Preparedness, How to Create an Emergency Evacuation Plan for Your Pets. Planning for Safe Animal Transportation. Get your pets used to being placed in a carrier or a crate. Uh, if you wait till the, the, an emergency situation when you absolutely have to and your animals uh, uh, aren't used to it, it can add to the stress of the animal. You can, it can also put you, uh, your safety in, in, a, in a jeopardizing position where the animal is going to 
fight to uh, to uh, go into the uh, kennel and uh, may eventually scratch or bite you. Um, prepare to move birds, snakes, lizards, ferrets, and pocket pets like hamsters and gerbils to secure cages or carriers. Prepare for emergency weather conditions, including uh, include blankets, ice packs, heating pads, and water miser in your kit. Obtain pets inside stickers from the ASPCA and place the stickers on your doors or windows with the numbers and types of pets in your home and place phone numbers where you can be reached. If time permits, remember to write evacuated with pets across the stickers if you flee with your pets. Here's a couple of pets that are getting ready to take off. Looks like they're going on vacation rather than going to an emergency shelter or being displaced by a disaster. Uh, here's a sticker uh, that uh, on the bottom right that you could uh, use. Uh, we have evacuated with our pets, uh, and this is the type of carrier on the top top left that uh, you might want to consider keeping your pets in, especially if you're going to a shelter. Uh, most shelters, most co-located uh, co shelters or animal shelters require that you bring some your own type of uh, cage or kennel to keep your animals in. Thank you very much. All of the information on this uh, presentation was, uh, was, uh, is uh, available through FEMA at ready.gov. Uh, the pamphlets are available. Uh, and, uh, I can, and please consider to, um, including your pets in your emergency evacuation plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for bearing with us, everyone. We're just having a little bit of technical problems today. Um, next, we have Colleen Kalin, and she is an environmental epidemiologist with the Kentucky Department for Public Health's Division of Public Health and Safety. And she is going to give us a presentation on vulnerable populations and climate-related health impacts. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Ms. Steels, or Shields, I'm sorry spoke very well about vulnerable populations um, beforehand, but I'm going to talk about how climate impacts health in general and how climate and health impacts relate to particularly vulnerable populations and the steps we can take to prepare and protect the most vulnerable people in our communities from climate-related health impacts. Okay, if I can advance my slide. Ah, there we go. Okay. This graphic developed by the Centers for Disease Control Building Resilience Against Climate Impacts uh, program shows exactly how climate does impact health of our communities. In the center of the wheel, you see the climate drivers, rising temperatures, which lead to more extreme weather, rising sea levels and increasing carbon dioxide levels. The outside of the wheel is the environmental exposures. And in the square, you see the related health impacts. And this graphic is um, available online and it's a very good go-to for describing the relationship between climate and health. 
Now, some climate-related health impacts, such as uh, drownings from floods or um, deaths and injuries from heat waves, are very obvious and immediate. But there are more subtle impacts, such as increasing rates of asthma and allergies caused by um, differing um, uh, levels and distribution of pollen. So ultimately, even wars and refugee populations and mental health disorders will be traced to our changing climate. Okay. This graphic developed by the U.S. Global Change Research Program gives pretty much the same information as the brace wheel, but it's more direct and related in a table format. And uh, both graphics are very helpful when you want to answer questions from the public about these uh, impacts. So, um, Ms. Shields in her previous presentation talked very well about what a vulnerable population is. Um, by the standard national programs, um, vulnerable populations are divided into four primary areas, socioeconomic, disability and housing composition, minority and limited English proficiency, and housing and transportation. And there are many different groups that can be at increased risk from the same hazard. For example, the elderly and people who work outdoors are both at increased risk to suffer from extreme heat events. Now, so exactly how are vulnerable populations impacted by changes in climate? Well, certain groups may be more likely to be exposed to a climate hazard, such as people who work outdoors might be more vulnerable to heat waves. People who live in uh, flood zones are obviously more vulnerable to floods. Also, some people might be more sensitive to the health impacts of climate change because of their underlying medical conditions or because of their age. Other people may be less likely to adapt or less able to adapt to a extreme weather event or a climate impact because of limited English proficiency, because of dependency on dialysis or oxygen, or to other um, pre-existing medical conditions. And this graphic by the U.S. Global Change Research Program can be accessed at health2016.globalchange.gov. And see, this graphic demonstrates how a climate driver uh, leads to an exposure which interacts with a sensitivity or a vulnerability to produce a health impact and a health outcome. And the, the ability to adapt to a climate impact can influence the exposure and resilience, which can in turn influence access to medical care and preventive services. So now we talked about the national level. Let's talk about Kentucky. And the top three hazards in our state, according to our emergency management plan, are floods, severe storms such as the 2009 ice storm, and a health emergency such as a severe influenza outbreak. From 2000 to 2012, there were 25 major disaster declarations in Kentucky and one presidential emergency declaration related to the 2009 ice storm. And all of these declarations were related to climate. So this map from the U.S. Center for Climate Change and Energy Solutions shows that most states don't currently have a plan on file to adapt to our changing climate. In our area, only Louisville and Cincinnati have plans on record. The Louisville's plan includes sections on land use, transportation, and urban forestry, but not a section specifically related to health impacts. Uh, here in Kentucky, Bowling Green, Frankfurt, Lexington, Louisville, Owensboro, Prospect, and Villa Hills have all signed the U.S. Conference of Mayors Climate Protection Agreement. So, 
Now that we've talked about the national and state level, let's talk about what's going on at the local level in our local health departments. And all climate impacts and mitigation plans ultimately must be uh, developed at the local level because all disasters and impacts are local. As climate impacts become more frequent and severe and public health interventions are required more frequently, our resources are going to become more strained. So we have to share our communication materials, our staff expertise, our documents, our templates, and all the other resources across jurisdictions and across our various agencies. Public health and emergency management especially must work very closely together to address these issues. So, to help local health departments and emergency planners develop and collect the data they need to develop their adaptation plans and guide their mitigation um, efforts, the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists has developed this document, which is available at the website listed above on the slide. And the ultimate purpose of collecting data on climate impacts, environmental exposures, and related health outcomes is to guide local actions so that they can do the most good for the greatest number of people who are at the highest risk for the worst impacts of climate-related health events. Okay. And the first step is to identify the hazards and impacts that are most likely to occur and the most damaging for your area. And the worst impacts can vary from neighboring jurisdictions and even within jurisdictions, depending on geography and the makeup of the population. And one of the best data sources we have available, which I'll talk about later, is the Environmental Public Health Tracking Network. The tracking network, which Kentucky recently joined in 2014, has climate data on flood and heat vulnerability, historical temperature and heat projection data, and information on heat-related morbidity and mortality at the state and county level. And in addition to the national tracking website, the State Pacific Kentucky Enviro Health Link website is going to be launched in the very near future. So, once you've identified the hazards that are a priority for your area, the next step is to determine which people need the most assistance, the most resources, and um, the most uh, assistance in your jurisdiction. Now, for this step, mapping tools like ArcGIS are specifically crucial to visualize your most vulnerable populations and to look at trends in health conditions and the environment. Creating a comprehensive vulnerability assessment requires combining all the four parts of uh, the vulnerability index that I'll talk about. And tying deaths and injuries directly to weather and climate can be difficult but the National Tracking Program and the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists are working on this to make this process more automated and uh, easier. Uh, okay, now we're going to talk about the most difficult but perhaps the most necessary step, and that is um, projecting potential uh, climate events and health impacts for your local jurisdiction. Um, this may require a great deal of computer modeling, and it does include a certain level of uncertainty, but this is what you really need to convince your key decision makers in your jurisdiction to fund your preparedness efforts and educate the public to prepare ahead of catastrophic events. Now, 
Okay. Yes, we have done this in Kentucky. The Environmental Health Link Program offered small grants to 10 local and regional health departments to apply these tools offered by the tracking network in their communities. The Green River District Health Department used their local grant to develop climate change indicators specifically for their jurisdiction. And they were able to add measures for extreme drought, uh, extreme heat, and flooding to their community health assessment. And the project leaders also submitted an article which summarized the available data and their findings for their jurisdiction. They compared the risk of environmental exposures to heat waves, drought, air pollution, and extreme precipitation events uh, among the seven counties in the district and rated them as high risk, moderate, or low compared with the rest of the state and with the U.S. They also looked at differences within their district among the seven counties. They compared um, the most urban county, which is Davis County, with the six more rural districts. And the authors recommended adding climate data collection and intervention to expand on their current surveillance activities and to strengthen public health preparedness and response. Now, in addition to the Green River District Health Department project, the Louisville Public Health and Wellness Department used their mini grant to address their urban heat island. And in case you don't know, Louisville is listed as the number one city for urban heat islands in the U.S. They developed a public information campaign called Hashtag Cool 502. And they promoted this campaign by distributing materials at public events like Homorama and with radio ads and advertisements on city bus posters. They also had a study and a symposium to explore the urban heat island issue and distributed a public awareness of urban heat island uh, survey, which gathered 282 responses. So now we might take a quick look at the tools that are available. Let's see, you can look at the social vulnerability index mapping tool which will allow you to um, explore the four areas of social vulnerability for your community at the county or zip code level. And of course, the Environmental Public Health Tracking Network, under their climate tab, they have data on community and community development. They have future temperature projection data and extreme heat events. They have also recently added indicators on flood vulnerability which include the square miles uh, that are in a FEMA flood area and the percentage of population at the county level that lives in a 100-year flood plain. And these are only a few of the available resources you can use to help you determine the actions you should take to protect the most vulnerable members of your community from extreme weather and climate change. And I hope this presentation has been useful to you. I am on the state global list if you have any questions. Thank you for your time and attention. Sorry, so much trouble to you. Yes.
Thank you for bearing with us, everyone. Um, this is our last presentation for the day, and it is an update on the Zika virus. And we are happy to have Dr. Annie Yaffe with us today. And she is a CDC Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer serving with the Kentucky Department for Public Health. Thank you and good morning. Um, today I will be presenting a background on Zika virus as well as um, an update about what we're doing in Kentucky. And I think slightly different from what maybe you've heard in some of the other presentations, this will focus on sort of a more general Kentucky population because we consider everyone in Kentucky to be vulnerable to contracting Zika virus should it become um, locally transmitted here. So, so today I'll be going over the epidemiology and transmission of Zika, as well as clinical effects, testing and reporting, and prevention. And throughout, I'll be discussing what Kentucky has been doing in this response. So a little bit of background on Zika virus. Zika is a flavivirus that was first discovered in 1947 in Zika forest of Uganda. Um, really didn't cause a lot of problems until 1952 when the first human cases were at least noted, although probably was causing disease before that point. And in, in 2015 was the first confirmed Zika virus infection in Brazil, which has started the whole um, current outbreak. Going over some Zika virus epidemiology. In the past, between 1947 and 2007, this graph represents the, uh, the map represents the geographical distribution of Zika virus. It was mostly in Africa and Southeast Asia. The red circle is Yap Island, where there was an outbreak in 2007. Today, basically all of the Americas are considered areas with active Zika transmission, including the United States. In the United States, we, in the continental United States, we've had the majority of our cases of uh, Zika virus travel associated. In Kentucky, um, we have also had travel associated cases. And as you can see on this map, um, our territories, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as American Samoa, have had um, numerous cases of local transmission of Zika. In addition, a small area in Florida, surrounded in Miami, has also noted cases of active transmission of Zika virus. As of actually today in Kentucky, we've had 29 confirmed cases of Zika virus disease. All cases are travel associated and there have been no cases of local transmission. And I should back up and state that those 29 cases are not necessarily disease, they are infections. So some patients may have been asymptomatic. Going into some um, history of Zika virus transmission. So Zika is an arthropod borne virus. Its main vector is the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Um, luckily, this mosquito is rare in Kentucky, so we estimate one in 5,000 mosquitoes in Kentucky is an Aedes aegypti mosquito. However, we uh, hypothesize that the Aedes albopictus, which is the alternate vector for Zika, um, is also capable of spreading Zika virus. This is a very common mosquito in Kentucky, and we think it has less efficient transmission of Zika, but should be able to transmit it. However, we don't know if this mosquito could sustain transmission in the continental United States until probably mosquito season next year. This demonstrates the mosquito range in the United States. The Aedes aegypti is shown on the map with the blue. And so you can see that Kentucky falls at the very northernmost um, extreme of the range of the Aedes aegypti, whereas the Aedes albopictus, shown in green, covers the majority of the continental United States, including Kentucky. In terms of transmission, in normal circumstances, Zika is transmitted in the sylvatic or jungle cycle. It, that's a primate to mosquito to primate to mosquito transmitted, um, and it remains sort of stable in the jungle environments. It only gets into the human population when a mosquito um, that has been infected by an infected primate then bites a competent human host and then can spread human to mosquito to human. There are a couple other methods of Zika virus transmission. So we know that it can be spread mother to child. This is thought to be due either during birth and during fetal development. 
And there's a theoretical risk of spread during breastfeeding through an infected um, secretions, but there are no reported cases of this currently. We also know that it can be spread by sexual transmission, and infected, infected persons can spread through any type of intercourse with any type of partner. In addition, the virus we know remains in semen longer than in blood. Um, in the most recent studies from CDC, it's been demonstrated to have virus in semen as late as six months after infection. We also think that this can be spread through blood transfusions, which have been reported in Brazil and are under investigation without any confirmed cases in the United States. But we do know that there have been positive um, donors in our blood supply, as well as um, in blood supplies during the French Polynesia outbreak a couple of years ago. Um, because of this, there are the um, blood, we've been um, working on blood safety and the blood banks are mandated at some point to begin universal screening. And we hope that the blood in Kentucky will imminently be screened for Zika virus as well as in the rest of the country. We also think that Zika virus can be spread through infected secretions. And this was related to a case that happened in Utah where uh, one um, patient, very infectious patient, was cared for by a relative, and that relative developed Zika without any of the other exposures listed. Going to some of the clinical effects, for the vast majority of people um, that contract a Zika virus infection, these people are asymptomatic. The incubation period ranges from a few days to week, a few weeks. And usually, if they develop illness, it's a self-limited mild illness. The four hallmark symptoms of Zika virus disease are a maculopapular rash, fever, arthralgia, and conjunctivitis. Rarely, adults and children who contract Zika may develop rare neurological complications like Guillain-Barre syndrome, and if contracted during fetal development, microcephaly. Unfortunately, there is no um, treatment for Zika, so it, the, um, there's only supportive care at this point. In terms of immunity, we don't know whether contracting Zika virus infection once gives you lifelong immunity, but we hypothesize that that would be the case like many other viruses. The main concern with Zika virus is um, pregnant women becoming infected and passing it on to their fetus. Pregnant women can become infected with Zika virus through the bite of an infected mosquito or through sexual acts with an infected person. And we know that a pregnant woman can pass Zika virus to her fetus either during the pregnancy and fetal development process or at the time of delivery. Zika has been associated with adverse fetal outcomes and including adverse pregnancy outcomes such as um, spontaneous abortion or adverse birth outcomes um, and developmental outcomes. The main um, one in the media is microcephaly, which some of you may have heard about, but there's also been noted to have other severe brain defects, defects of the eye, hearing deficits, and impaired growth, and other neurological defects. Unfortunately, Zika is so, this outbreak is so new and ongoing that uh, some research is still being done, and we don't know the full effects of these kids. Um, some of the, the first babies that were diagnosed with microcephaly in Brazil are not even a year old yet, so we're still in the process of evaluating these outcomes and learning the full extent of this disease. For those of you who don't know, microcephaly is a birth defect where the baby's head is smaller when compared to the baby's, other baby's heads of the same sex and age. It's very uncommon. Um, and state birth defect tracking registries estimate about 2 to 12 babies per 10,000 live births um, over a, in the past. Um, Kentucky does track this now, um, and we're currently looking at our rates to see if this is comparable. Microcephaly can be isolated or in combination with other birth defects. And it can be caused by infections, such as the torch infections during pregnancy, exposure to toxins like drugs or alcohol, interruption of the blood supply to the baby's brain during development, or lack of nutrients. This diagnosis can be made either during pregnancy on ultrasound, like later on in the pregnancy, or after birth with measurements, so fetal, uh, neonatal head measurement, head circumference after delivery, and an MRI can also be conducted in challenging cases. 
Unfortunately, again, there is no treatment, and this is a lifelong condition. Mild microcephaly may um, lead to developmental delays and at the minimum requires monitoring for such delays with routine checkup. And severe microcephaly will require possibly advanced care and treatment for other health problems, numerous types of physical therapies, and possibly medications for seizure disorder, among others. At this time, like I said, we still have a lot of questions about Zika and pregnancy. We don't know, for example, if a pregnant woman is exposed, how likely is it that she will develop Zika? And if she is infected, how likely will it be that that virus will affect her or the pregnancy? How likely is it that Zika will pass on to her fetus? And if the fetus is infected, how likely is it that the fetus will develop these birth defects? And at what point in pregnancy does infection cause harm to the um, fetus? And what about sexual transmission? Is that the same risk as a mosquito-borne transmission, or is that a different risk to the fetus? So these are all questions that many people around the world are looking at and working on, and we hope to have answers. And there is data forthcoming every week from CDC and as well as other public health uh, agencies about these questions. At this time, we don't expect that Zika will pose a risk for birth defects in future pregnancies, but again, we just don't know enough. Because of the, these risks, the uh, CDC has developed the U.S. Zika Pregnancy Registry, and so they're collaborating with us at the state health departments to collect information about Zika virus infection during pregnancy and after birth to help um, guide messages for the public, give clinical guidance, and just learn more about this disease. So for healthcare professionals, um, what we really want to impart to you is that you know what resources available to you, what testing to do, and that Zika needs to be reported to the state and local health departments. And then that patients need to be educated about these risks, especially before travel and upon return from travel. We'll get into a little bit of prevention a little bit later in this talk. So in terms of testing and reporting, the most up-to-date guidelines for testing um, include any patient with a history of travel to a Zika-affected area, so the, all those areas in the Americas with active transmission, including Miami and certain areas in the um, continental United States, who become either symptomatic within two weeks of travel or who traveled during pregnancy or within eight weeks of conception. And also, infants born to females with positive or inconclusive tests for Zika virus can also be tested. In addition, we're testing those individuals who are, have a history of exposure to Zika, such as under, unprotected intercourse with a Zika-positive patient, and who become either symptomatic or pregnant. So our current testing process, um, the Zika virus can be tested at either the state lab or at commercial labs. So if the patient is symptomatic or had symptoms within 14 days of presentation, we can do a PCR on urine and blood. And if they were never symptomatic or, or symptomatic to, be, prior to the two weeks, between two and 12 weeks, they can have an IgM on their blood. The confirmatory test is run at CDC, which is a plaque reduction neutralization assay. But also, commercial labs are doing the same PCR on urine and blood and IgM on blood. The problem with the labs is that PCR is only accurate within 14 days of symptom onset, and IgMs should be accurate after 14 days, between 2 and 12 weeks. But unfortunately, an IgM can have both false positive and false negative. A negative IgM suggests that a recent infection did not occur, but again is not definitive, depending on the patient's immune status and whether they amounted that um, immune reaction. In addition, IgM can falsely be po positive with reactions with closely related flaviviruses like dengue, yellow fever, or even the yellow fever vaccine. The risk of false positive therefore leads to difficulty in counseling um, your patients regarding pregnancy. And unfortunately, we, don't, we just don't know how likely the detection of Zika virus is to indicate harm to the fetus or the pregnancy. These cases um, need to be reported within one business day by phoning the local health department and submitting an EPID 200 reportable disease form. 
The cases are investigated by the state and local health departments and reported to CDC via NEDS and ARBONET and the U.S. Pregnancy Registry. So how can we prevent Zika? So in Kentucky, at this time, we have no cases of locally transmitted or demonstrated active transmission. Kentucky is partnering with the University of Kentucky Entomology Department to um, test mosquitoes for Zika and um, do some trapping. And so far, we've not identified any mosquitoes in Kentucky that are infected with Zika virus. However, at this time, our most um, important barrier to Zika transmission is mosquito prevention and control, which means reducing contact between humans and mosquitoes, removing mosquito breeding sites, and this is especially important to protect our local mosquito population from people who have traveled within the last three weeks to Zika affected areas. So firstly, the key aspects of protection from mosquitoes include long sleeves and pants, sealing homes, um, openings to homes, and using EPA registered insect repellent. EPA registered insect repellent includes active ingredients like DEET, Picardin, um, an oil of lemon eucalyptus, and you can read on the labels what, uh, whether it's EPA approved and what the ingredients are. These are safe for pregnant women and children, but different um, ingredients have different age groups that they can go down to. For example, the oil of lemon eucalyptus is for older children. So the mosquitoes that spread Zika are daytime aggressive biters. They don't leave, they are, live close to home, so they breed by your home, they live their life cycle by your home, and they die by your home. So the mosquitoes that are in your backyard and around your home are your mosquitoes, and those are the ones that are most likely to be transmitting uh, infectious disease to you and your family. Um, there are many common backyard mosquito sources, and these mosquitoes can breed in a little bit of water as much as the top of a bottle cap from a um, soda bottle. And so there's a lot of different uh, places in, around homes that people need to be checking and some things that maybe you wouldn't have considered in the past. So even um, as much water that's in the crack of a leaky hose, in uh, clogged rain gutters, water and pet bowls for, and pet toys, um, any potted plants, fountains, buckets, ponds, children's toys, tires, anything like that, even low areas in your backyard could be a risk. So these are just some examples of places to look around in your backyard. So it's important to eliminate these breeding sites, so turn over your bat bird baths, turn over anything that you can to prevent standing water. There's also a um, possibility for using larvicides and adulticides around your home and especially mosquito-affected areas. And it's important to talk with people, especially vulnerable populations who may not be able to protect themselves from mosquitoes as aggressively as you would like, about the need to reduce these breeding sites around our home. Kentucky Department for Public Health has a um, mosquito prevention campaign called Bite the Bite. Um, so this is for both daytime and nighttime biting mosquitoes, and we urge everyone to understand the risks of mosquitoes and how to prevent them around their homes. In addition, uh, the Kentucky Department of Public Health and the local health departments partner with the Department of Agriculture to do mosquito abatement activities when there's a nuisance mosquito complaint or in particular cases of Zika virus. In addition, it's important to prevent sexual transmission. So any traveler who returns from a Zika affected area should wear condoms after departure from that area. For females, regardless of symptoms, females should use condoms for eight weeks after the last day of departure from the affected area. For males, unfortunately, despite, regardless of symptoms, they should be using condoms for six months after departure from the Zika affected area. In addition, if either a male or female has a partner who is pregnant, the condom should be used for the duration of that partner's pregnancy. So we really urge people at this time to be educated and to be sharing that education with patients, with fr friends and family, and with vulnerable um, residents of Kentucky, because that's the only way that we can really protect our local mosquito population and prevent active spread of Zika in Kentucky. Um, we urge all travelers to use mosquito repellent during travel and for three weeks after return. We um, hope to educate travelers to wear condoms, have Travelers postpone travel, especially if pregnant, and then um, 
youth prevention and control measures in general in daily life. And we work a lot with um, local health care providers and the local health departments, so they can serve as a resource for you as well. Um, and that's about it. We have an Instagram, um, Marty Mosquito, who shares some mosquito knowledge, so if you want to follow him. And otherwise, there's three of us on the Zika surveillance team, and we're happy to answer your questions at any time. Thank you.